like that at the house, you need an extra one. <laughs> See, the sermon title this morning, The Art of Listening, we'll be talking about that in just a moment. But it, there is an art to listening that most people haven't quite captured. But let me first of all thank you on behalf of my family uh, for all your gratitude, uh, your graciousness, your prayers, the meal the church provided, looking over and after us and constantly checking in on us during this time my mom going to be with Jesus. Uh, you're such a blessing. You know, what a great church you're a part of. Amen. Go ahead and give yourselves a hand. This is, this is a great church. People love the Lord and love each other. A lot of people look all their lives for a church like this and never get one. Amen. Amen. Hope, you, hope you know what you got. Amen. It's a great, great blessing to be a part of Believer's Fellowship. And uh, to be the pastor of Believer's Fellowship is even a greater blessing. Amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about this, this topic today. You know, Brother Tim's done such an excellent job the, the last Sunday of the year, the first Sunday of the month, just nailing down the importance of our following Jesus and surrendering our hearts and our lives to him. And I want to, I want to get to, I think the very first part of this year, let me add one little word to all that we're going to be sharing in words over the next year. Should the Lord delay is coming that long and should we all be here that long? It is important that we learn how to hear. So I'm taking a little different turn at my message today before getting into a new sermon series or anything like that. I want to just talk to you about listening today. And I'd like for you to listen <laughs> while I talk about listening. A lot of people don't understand the power that is in listening. It, it's, it's extremely important. And a lot of people haven't learned that lesson. I did notice the, being together with family, and we have a big one over the last week or so, to just sit and listen to everybody talking. My family's probably like your family. Everybody talks at one time. <laughs> Can I get a witness? You know, and you get in the room and everybody's talking. And of course, since you're family and you've been with each other all your lives, you just know what they're going to say, or at least you think you do. You know what's coming next and we just don't listen. Listening, it really is, needs to be developed and it really needs to be honed in our life of how to be really good listeners, you know, because ultimately we are disciples of Christ, which means we're ever learning, you know, but we don't want to be like that group of people that the prophets had to deal with who were ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And that's possible. And the way you do that is by not being a good listener and not hearing what's, what's really being said and what's going on. And uh, a couple of guys that I don't, am not envious of their ministries in the Old Testament were Isaiah and Ezekiel. God calls Isaiah and he calls Ezekiel in a lot of the same ways, but as he deals with them and he's giving them their ministries, he tells them both, oh, by the way, speak what I tell you to speak, preach what I tell you to preach, live it out in your life. And, and they both have this in one way it's written or another, but it says something like this. By the way, nobody's going to listen. <laughs> How'd you like to start out with that ministry calling? I want you to preach the word. Nobody's going to listen. You know, I used to have this recurring nightmare. I mean, it was real. It was just, and I hadn't had it in a long time. Maybe that's because you're starting to listen. But I'd be preaching in a, in a large assembly hall and nobody would be listening. And I'd be preaching really good. You know, people just sitting down there, chatting one another, talking on their phones, you know, doing all kinds of texting one another. But nobody be listening. And in this nightmare, I'd yell out, oh, yeah, you're going right down right on the pulpit, you know, beat my shoe on the pulpit, just to get to, and nobody pay attention. Nobody was listening. You know, that, that's tragic. And, you know, because we in this new covenant age, if there's anything that's going to transform our lives, is learning how to be listeners. It's the word of God that changes us. You know, and if we can embrace the word of God and allow it to really change us and be teachable, and part of that great part of that teachability is being able to listen, man, what a transformation God can do in our lives. Jesus in the parable of the sower and the seed, that was really a parable about hearing, remember? He said the sower went and sowed seeds in the field and the birds came and stole it. And that's how the devil keeps people from listening to the word of God, kind of goes in one ear and out the other ear and the other. And then he said something like, you know, and then some seeds were sown by the wayside. Remember the seeds are the word of God. That's the word of God. And it, some being distributed here, some being thrown here. And only those who really heard the word of God did it make any difference. And it says it brought forth fruit, some 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. In other words, hearing the word of God, embracing the word of God brought tremendous life change. I mean, even just if all you get is 30-fold, that's a pretty good deal. Amen. 30 times what you've invested. You can't be an investment like that. You won't find investments like that in the, in the culture we live in. But Jesus, in sharing that parable, he gets down about verse 14. He says, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Remember he's talking about those people in here? 
They will be ever hearing, but never understanding, will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Verse 15 goes on to say, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. The Lord says, and when that happens, and I would heal them. I said, I'd do something great in their lives, but they won't hear what I'm having to say to them. But he goes on, he's talking to the disciples and he gives us verse 16 in that chapter. He says this, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and many righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear ye, listen ye to what's being said. Jesus is telling us it's important you hear. And you look at the book of Revelation when the church is getting this message, the Lord's constantly speaking to the churches of Revelation. He says, hear. Anyone who has ears to hear, let him hear. In Hebrews, it says, if you have ears to hear, let him hear. In the Gospels, it says, hear, let him hear. In the Epistles, it talks about hearing and listening to what God is saying to us. It's an important part of, of our Christian walk in life is to learn how to hear. Listening to God is extremely important. Hearing God's word is extremely important because literally that is what will transform, that is what change, that's what brings healing into my life. In fact, if you listen to Isaiah and Ezekiel and even Jeremiah, there were tremendous consequences, not rewards, consequences, negative consequences that came as a result of not hearing the word of God. I mean, it was being spoken, they just weren't hearing which seems to be the problem. So I want to talk about even more than just the art of listening today. I think as we begin this year, it might be good to start with a sermon that talks about not just how to listen, but let me put it this way, how to listen to a sermon. How to listen to a sermon. How to really get what God's trying to say to you from the sermon. Because the sermon you know, is, is that word from God which we ought to be able to hear. When you study the scriptures, you see that the body functions uniquely as a body and that it has so many gifts. But part of that gift is the gift of the pastor teacher. And it says that when people are functioning in their gifts, that God is moving. One, in the fact that they're operating in the way that God's called them to operate and minister in the way they've called them to minister. But also says, as the gifts of the body, of the spirit are being ministered through the body, then to one, it goes on to say, is given this gift of healing. To another, a word of faith. To another, in other words, it talks about all the things that are happening when the church is being the church and we're responding the way God wants us to respond, that God starts doing things within the congregation. I'm always desiring on some level as I preach or even as I finish the preaching to somehow just to pull the veil back and to see just what was the result of, of our hearing the word of God. Was there anything that kind of brought any transform, more transformative life at all. So hearing. So let's talk about specifically how to listen to a sermon. Now the sermon, the, the process of how to listen to the sermon, let me say, doesn't start when the piano hits the last note of the hymn or worship course that we just sang right before the preacher gets up, all right? That's not, that's not when it begins. This art of listening and the practice of learning how to hear a sermon starts long before that. And I believe there's this process in listening to a sermon. And I, let me just go over some of the steps. I think the first one is this. When you come to church, arrive expectantly. That means you arrive hungry. You arrive prepared. When you come to church, you come to worship the Lord. Come with an anticipation about that. Come with an anticipation that I wanna, I wanna worship God. And I wanna see, my, I wanna walk out here knowing that my soul has been fed, you know, that my spirit has been touched by the grace of God. When you come to church, bring an appetite. That's why it helps to come early, you know? Amen. Nothing worse than being late at the restaurant and everybody else is there before you, having to stand around and wait forever. Come on. Get here on time and get here with an expectation that you're gonna get something from God. Say, when I get to church, I can't wait to get to church because I know God's gonna speak to my heart and God's gonna say something to me. I mean, today, if you were telling me before the service, if you were to come up and ask me, Brother Joe, can you go to lunch with me? I want to buy your lunch and I'm going to take you to Papacitas. I can tell you, if you told me that before church, I wouldn't stop by the Shipley Donut Box. <laughs> I wouldn't. Why? Because I love Papacitos, right? I don't want to ruin, ruin it all, right? I, I want to enjoy every, that's kind of like when you go to some of these places and they, they feed you all this salad or chips. Hey, get me to the good stuff. Yeah. Save, save room for the good stuff. 
I, I want, I, so there's, there's this expectation, you know, that, I, that, I, that, it's, that God's really going to speak to me and he's going he's to give me a word. And, and with the context of the expectation is that I should arrive hungry, all right? I arrive hungry, I arrive expecting God to speak to my heart, to feed my soul, you know, and, I, and I'm hungry for what is righteous. Job put it this way. In the book of Job, he says this, I have esteemed thy word. In other words, I have desired your word more than my necessary food. I can skip breakfast, but I can't skip the word. All right. I can skip lunch, but I can't skip the word. And we have it just backwards, man. I skip the word for breakfast. And it gets to this point of priorities. Do we really believe that the word of God is that which transforms our life and changes our lives and makes us more like Christ and does this grace work in us? I think also we arrive prepared. What does that mean? Well, I have my Bible. That's a good start. Amen. <laughs> But I think we have to do some advance work before we get to church if we're going to be prepared for church, all right? To get ourselves in an attitude and an uh, of expectation for the Word of God. One of those is prayer, and that's not just to pray for yourself. That's, that should be the obvious. God, I want to have an open mind and open heart. But I think you pay, pray, for, pray for the preacher. Pray, pray for whoever is preaching. If you're going to lift group, pray for your teacher. Pray that God would, would speak to them. Pray that God would help them in preparation. I don't know but if, if you realize it or not, Sermon preparation is hard work to really do it right, to really prepare a sermon. It takes more than, than just a couple of minutes, you know. Some of you may think, oh, Brother Joseph opens the Bible and starts espousing something. No, you know, I'm not real smart. I'm not the sharpest knife in the door. So it takes me even a little bit longer than maybe even some others to study the Word and prepare for the Word. And I, on top of that, I'm one of those guys, when I grew up going to school, I hated to study. Anybody else like that? I hated to study. I hated to test because you had to study more. You know, in fact, I'd wait the last, I sat that kid who stepped two or three o'clock in the morning, studying so hard for the test, spend all the energy getting ready for it and then sleep through the test. <laughs> and tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Now I have to study all the time. So I thank the Lord. Maybe if I'd learned it earlier, I wouldn't have to study so hard. But you pray, say, what do you pray? What, what should I pray for, for you, Pastor? And people ask me that, that occasionally. I pray, especially in regard to my preaching, one, pray for, for me to have understanding. What is the Bible saying in this regard? What, what is this text saying? What, what is God, God trying to say to me, to our church, to our fellowship? Pray for insight that God opened my eyes, opened my heart, give me clarity on it. Pray for stamina, stamina in the process of studying because it, it does get hard. And, and it, Anybody who does, really takes time to study knows this. Tim knows this. There's just times you're just studying, you know, I just, I gotta close the Bible, walk away from it because my mind's hurting, you know, or you're, or you're struggling over something. There's times when it sometimes just flows, but that's not most of the time. And most of the time you're digging. You're studying to understand the text. You're studying to, 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 to have, uh, you know, I think part of this is praying for creativity. You're praying to have, you know, it's easy to fall back on some tried and true old sermon outline or something, but you need creativity. What is the Lord speaking? How does this relate to our fellowship, to our church, to our relationship with God? What's God saying to us as a people? If I'm going to be a mouthpiece, I want to be a mouthpiece that's prepared to speak the word of God. And so, you know, to, to pray for your pastor is not a waste of time. Now, I know how to prepare a sermon for the most part. I've been doing this like 100 years now, All right, at least a long while. And there are times when I may be preparing as many as 10 sermons at one time. Because I have a conference coming up, followed by a marriage retreat, followed by a youth retreat, by something else, by a pastor's conference. And so there may be a long line of things that I'm preparing for. I may, if you, if you walk around here much, you may see that I'd be preparing for a conference, writing a workbook, and then preparing for a retreat or something after that, and along with it all. So there are a few times in the year, at least two times a year, where I'm just, there's a bulk of stuff prepared. And so I know how to hammer out the basics just because I've done it so many times. But to really get into it and really do it right and to do it in such a way that it won't be boring because it, the, my biggest, I guess, fight that I, I struggle with as your pastor is not being repetitive in the boring sense. There's some things we must always be repetitive on but to be creative and to be anointed and to be prepared with a heart that, that challenges your heart and mind. So there's a great responsibility on me, but please understand, as much as God holds me responsible for preparing it, he holds you responsible for listening to it and receiving it. Amen. And so we, we're praying for each other in this regard that I have ears to hear, that I have an open heart, open mind. So that I'm, you know, there's this discipline in my life to hear as well as to work methodically, carefully, and be skillful in what the Lord is saying to me. Because the Bible tells us whatever we do for the Lord, we should do it with all our might. 
The Bible says that we should, as musicians, even there's a passage that says you should play skillfully before the Lord. The Lord doesn't want our musicians being haphazard and sloppy. Amen? That's why they rehearse. That's why they get here early. That's why they practice over and over. Because the Lord requires us of our, our service to him. But it's important that we do it because we're honoring the Lord with it. But each and every one of us, there's this part of, a, of arriving prepared that has to do with, with, with prayer. But let me tell you another a part of this arriving prepared is, some of you won't like this part, get a good night's sleep. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that evening and morning were the first day. It doesn't say morning and evening. If you go to Israel and it's Shabbat, we think, well, Shabbat, that's Saturday. When does Shabbat begin? It begins Friday evening when the sun goes down. Why then? Because evening and morning were the first day. Now, Joseph's here. He can tell you how many Saturday nights. I made him come in a lot earlier than he wanted to. Because <laughs> why? Because we have church tomorrow. Because it's the Lord's day tomorrow. Because we want to be clear. We want to be sharp. And every one of us are tempted to probably stay up on Saturday night far too long than what we ought to because we're not sharp. You know, I, I'm not, these lights are kind of blinding for the most part, but I see it when you nod off. Yeah, yeah. You got your eyes peeled open. Then your wife's sitting there giving you this, or your husband, you know, you, know, you got a little drool coming out your chin. We don't have to stay up every night so late. I mean, you know, Letterman and Fallon and all those guys can certainly steal your time that's valuable in more ways than we would allow them to. We're playing games or whatever it might be. Listen, let me put it this way. Sermon writing is very hard on me. Made that clear, right? But let me tell you something else you might not know. Sermon listening is hard on you. It takes discipline to listen. I mean, if we're really going to pay attention, if we're really going to grab what's being said, so we need, that. we need to get a grip on our priorities. I mean, if I realize that church is tomorrow and it's an important day and it's holy to the Lord, then I should be ready for that day. And I'm going to honor the Lord with it. And so uh, I, I need to get a grip on my fundamental priorities of life. And certainly the Lord's day is one of them. So if, as I'm preparing and as I'm arriving prepared, just get a good night's sleep. And while you're here, once you're here, part of listening and being prepared is keep your mind open to the word of God. Not necessarily to my opinion of the word of God, but to the word of God. What is the Bible really saying? We, I think it's important. I mean, your children, I hate to tell you this, mom and dad, but your children think you're a moron. <laughs> no amens from the youth department, please. And maybe even your grandchildren do. And they might not say that loud, but they, you know, they really don't know what's going on. You know, they just, you know, they're living from another time, another place. But yet in your life, you've lived a lot. And you've experienced a lot. Now, that's good in a lot of ways, all right? But there can be some negatives to that, too, in regard to being open-hearted to what the Lord say. In other words, the pastor might be talking about prayer and talking about the power of prayer and faith praying and believing God, but yet in your experience, maybe you've been getting some no's from God in answered prayer, and that's not the answer you've been wanting. And so your experience kind of comes to meet those thoughts about pray, believe, trust God. And he says, I don't know. I kind of felt like God might have failed me that last time. I didn't get what I wanted. You see, you've closed your mind. You've led a situation. Maybe the, maybe the pastor's preaching about holiness in the Lord and there's some, some sin or something that's mentioned from the pulpit and all of a sudden there's this wall that goes up right there before you. It's mental. The pastor doesn't say it, but it, boom, it just pops up. You really don't want to hear that, you know, because the experience of your life is completely different, all right? And your experience of your life is you have failed there and you've justified or rationalized or whatever it might be, and you, still, you don't want to talk about that anymore. You don't want to talk about that sin, or you don't want to talk about that thing, or you don't want anybody to talk about marriage, or maybe you don't want to talk about your home life, or per, you know, whatever it is. Your mind is not open. You've shut the door to your mind, and you're not hearing what God has to say to you. And so you, to arrive, prepare me, say, you know, I'm not going to have these barriers that between me and the Lord. So if the Lord speaks to me today, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to trust him, and I'm going to hear what he has to say. I'm going to come with an open mind. Another thing is, and this is why we put a lot of work into with our overhead projectors and, and the media that we present with, is you know, there's an outline there to help you keep your thought in order and to follow that outline. It's, it's simple, but it helps you to keep reflecting on what the, the purpose or the intent of that message is. And so follow along with it, kind of stay consistent with it. And this last one, many of you are really good at this next one, all right? And many of you have absolutely failed. But, you know, you don't have to do this. It's not going to make you go to hell or anything. <laughs> but it will help you if you do. You say, what is it? Have a pen ready. God may say something to you, blow your mind. 
That's what I appreciate about my mom sitting here at almost 90 years of age, every sermon with her pen and pad, pencil out. And I'm thinking, I hope I say something she can write down. <laughs> but how many times, you know, whether it's in your Bible, I've got all kinds of notes penciled in the back of my Bible, just some sermons I've said. These are not my sermons necessarily. These are other sermons that I've heard on, by preachers on radio or tape or listening to in person. I mean, there's always some the outlines of the Bible, just something. When you write something down, it helps you remember it more. I mean, we're all visual learners. We're all verbal learners on different levels and some more one way than the other. But one thing that really helps everybody, if God spoke a word to you, man, just, just pencil This is what God said to me today. You may never even look at that again. But yet there's something about writing it down that just puts it in your mind, clarifies it in your heart, and, and, and gives you that, that little truth you've held on to. It increases the likelihood that you'll act on what the Spirit's telling you, I believe, on some level. Now, this, is, this seems elementary, but folks, this is important because if the Word of God is the Word of God, then we need to learn how to hear it. So we, we want to arrive expectantly. The second thing is, once you get here, and we've talked about this expectation and being ready when we get there, once you've arrived here, the second thing is this. Listen attentively. Pay attention. Because we know we live a very busy world, and there's all these things that are always going through our mind. We pull out our pencils, oh, I got these apartments tomorrow, I'm gonna write that down, you know, I gotta make that delivery, I gotta do whatever it might be, and we miss it. Human nature in and of itself tends not to want to hear the Word of God. Human nature in itself tends not to want to really study the Word of God. Human nature in its fallen state always has, my opinion, valued much higher than everybody else's opinion. So you listen attentively. How do you do that? I think you, first of all, you listen purposefully. Okay? There is a purpose behind it. God is speaking to you and there's something purposeful that he's saying to it. And you won't process what you hear until you really listened to it and heard it and maybe you can even articulate it in your own words. So you're listening to understand. You're listening to get a grip on it. One guy said, well, you're listening so you can grow. It's more than just listening so I can grow. It's listening so I can be transformed. The Word of God is what makes me clean. The Word of God is what matures me. The Word of God is what delivers me. The Word of God is what, what changes my life. And so I'm listening with that purpose for that transformed life. So I listen clearly, not just kind of, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people come to church and they're listening, but they got two or three things. They, you know, they got things they're doing over here and writing notes to somebody else or texting or, you know, playing their game. So I wouldn't do that in church. Oh, come on, I know you. <laughs> you know, and, and somebody says something, you know, here, it's like, Everybody just thinks what everybody else is going to say or they think they know what they're going to say. Like the guy said, Jay said, Wendy, ain't it? He said, no, it's Thursday. <laughs> he said, so am I. Let's go get a drink. <laughs> that may be a hard of hearing issue. I don't know. But whatever it is, we should listen with some kind of realization that, hey, there's a purpose. I'm not just sitting in church because that's what I do on Sunday. I, I'm here to understand and receive what God has for me to speak. So listen purposefully, but also listen actively. It may not be possible for some people, but it is possible if we work at it to, to hear a sermon that lasts 30 to 40 minutes. All right? It's usually 40 to 45 minutes is about the range of what most people can listen to something or someone speak. But to get to 35 and 40 minutes, I'll tell you honestly, it takes hard work to stay focused, to, to, to pay attention. It takes some discipline. It requires effort. And I, I think it's that way because... Our modern media has made it so easy to become lazy in our thought process. And, you know, it's like we're, we'd rather be amused. In fact, that's why a lot of preachers think they have to be the next David Letterman, you know, or something. You've got to come out and put, be funny and put on a show or whatever it might be. Because that, well, there's nothing wrong with being uh, uh, amusing, but understand what amuse means. It comes from a Greek word. The participle, the first letter of amuse is the letter A, which is a Greek participle meaning the negative or not. It's like an a theist is somebody who loves God, and knows God, believes in God. What's an atheist? Atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God. Muse, most of y'all meant to, if I'm going to muse something, it means to think on something. So to amuse means not to think. That's why the Bible says in the last days, men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Why? Because they want amusement. They don't want to think. They don't want to consider that, you know, the Bible says in the scripture makes it clear, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. God says, use your mind. Use your thinking processes. Think about what I'm telling you. Focus on what I'm saying to you. But we'd rather be amused. We want to go to the movies. We want to go to that. And there's nothing wrong with some amusement. But if that's your life, then you, you really have a, a problem in, in listening and paying attention and having discipline in your life and listening actively. 
And therefore you miss what God's doing. Jesus said in that verse 15 I read a while ago, the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Therefore God doesn't do something in your life. They're not healed. Now the third part, after we get to listening attentively, coming ready and prepared, listening attentively, the third part is comply. You know, whatever God's saying to you, respond to that. Obey what the Lord reveals to your heart. In fact, we ought to be asking ourselves a lot of time, even as we study the Bible by ourselves, how does this apply to me? What's God saying to me? Lord, speak to my heart. I mean, it's kind of a senseless study if that's not the goal of it, to hear from God, and to speak with God, and to fellowship with God. But comply. Now this is what pleases God. Jesus said in verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. What do he say? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like he who built his house upon the rock. In other words, you want your life to have substance. You want your life to be able to handle the trials that come your way, the winds, the rain, the floods, every one of us face those in our life. You may be going through a windy time right now. You may be going through a rainy time in your life. You may be going through a flooding. It seems like you're about to drown. But Jesus said, you know, if you would take my word, build your life on it, those things will not defeat you. They will come, but they won't wreck you. They won't ruin you. You have a foundation on which to stand. Now, let me just reflect just for a moment because I think it makes the point. I, I, if you were at the memorial service for my, my mother, I, I made a point in regards to the kind of life that should be lived. It's a life that's according to the word of God. And now my mom, she really loved the word of God. I'm not passionate. She really does love the word of God. All right. She, she loves the word of God. And because of it, her life was not only impacted supernaturally, but her life impacted other people supernaturally. Now, this is what's supposed to be happening in our life. As we hear the word of God and we comply to the word of God, something is going on in our heart and life. God is doing a work in us, transforming us. Because, because, because I really can't make it without him to, to, to start with. But my philosophy of life needs to be wed. It needs to be intertwined. It needs to be embracing, ingrained into the word of God. I mean, that I look at things from that perspective now, all right? That my life is to be lived from God's perspective. It's to be spiritually minded. It's life and peace, the scripture says. If you want life, you want peace, then you're going to take your philosophy, your worldview, wad it up, throw it in the trash, and say, here's the worldview, here's the philosophy that I need to embrace. And if I do, then my house is like that, on that foundation and upon that rock. I love thy law, David, the psalmist said. I love thy truth. I long for thy precepts. Read Psalms 119 over and over through the longest psalm of all is the constant repetition of the fact that God's word is what we need. It's the only thing that will save us. It's the only thing that will sustain us. It's the only thing that will help us. It's the only thing that can give us true guidance. It's the only thing that can give us real substance. And it's the only thing that can give us lasting peace. So we want to hear it. And when we hear it, then we need to comply to what the Lord says. Compliance pleases the Lord. But let me tell you one other thing about compliance. Compliance will change your life. God, God changes our life. God works in a supernatural way. Verse 15, the Lord said that in that verse we read a while ago, that they would hear my words and I would heal them. I would change their life. This heal word is, is that it's, it's, it's all encompassing. Now, we're not just talking about a physical thing here. We're talking about our emotions. We're talking about our mind. We're talking about our soul. God knows we need a healing. God knows that we, this fallen nature is wounded and bruised and bleeding. And the only thing that brings real substance to us and gives us real direction is the power of the word of God. You, but I, I want you to see today the, 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 the link, all right, between... Hearing God's word and being changed over and over and over. It's in scripture. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. So the more that I learn how to hear, really hear it, really embrace it, really take it in, really receive it, then the more God does in my life. Those who hear God and understand God's word, they're the ones that turn to God. And they're the ones who God touches their life and does the work in their life. 
I guess the big question is for me at this point would it be to ask myself or you to ask yourself, okay, I'm hearing the word of God, but is it making a difference in my life? I'll let you know something, folks. I've been pastoring around here for a while. Some of you have been around here that whole while. And I've been watching your lives. Even some of you that have been around here for a shorter time. And I have seen the power of God and his word at work in so many of your lives. Don't feel so discouraged at times. It's good every once in a while to look and just see maybe how far you have come. <laughs> Sometimes we're so busy looking how far we are from the goal yet. We don't realize what God has done. That there's this, this work that God's doing. Some of you, I mean, just from the last year alone, look at the things that have changed in your life. The attitudes, the disciplines, some of the habits. I mean, it, it, your reactions. Yeah, there's a long way to go for all of us. But understand, God's been working. God's not failed you. God's been moving. God still wakes you up in the morning and makes himself known to you. And reveals his will and reveals his heart. When that little light comes on and says, don't do that or do this, that's God drawing and ministering and leading and leading you to the fountain of life, that word of God. Our lives are to be transformed, literally changed in the way I live my life. I mean, some of you can look back over the last year and maybe a year ago, Satan had his, he had his dirty hand around your neck in some real strong way and was strangling you. And it's not there anymore. Yeah, you're still struggling in some areas. You may still think about those things, but it's not like it used to be, is it? Because the grace of God that came from you hearing and believing the word of God. And in faith, you have trusted what you've heard and God has responded. Now, if you're looking at your life and say, well, Brother Joe, I don't see any changes in my life. Well, we've got a bigger problem, what you know. The bigger problem is you need to give your life to Christ. That's the first step. You've got to give your heart to Jesus. Now, the Bible says repent. The word means change your mind. Now your mind can start hearing. Now your mind can start receiving. Now your mind can start responding. You're not shutting the word of God. Out. Well, I, I'll put it this way. If you're not changed since you've come to Jesus, if you are still what you used to be, and there's been no change whatsoever, then you didn't come to Jesus. You might've got religion. You might've got baptized. You might've felt bad for the way you were living your life. But the Bible makes it very clear. If any man is in Christ or a woman, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. You may just need to get back to the cross. Now, the last thing I want to share with you in regard to this is hearing the word of God is begin to focus on the priority. Even listening to the sermon, focus on the priority. Put it well this way. The main thing to remember is that the main thing is the main thing. When it comes to listening to the word of God, there's a main thing going on here. All right. The main thing. In fact, there's three things I really want you to focus on when you talk about the main thing and what God's doing and keeping to remember, remembering the main things, the main thing. I think after you finish the word of God, after you heard the word of God, there's three questions that can help you get back to the main thing. One is, who is God? Who is God? You know, that question comes up a lot in scripture and then it gives an answer. You know, who is God? Who's the redeemer? Who's the God of the universe? There's none like him. Then it goes on to give these great answers. Who is God? When everything's said and done and we've opened up the word of God and we've gotten a little closer glimpse of him, just who is in our life. Who is he? Isaiah in chapter six says, he's holy God, holy. He's holy. God, there's nobody like you. You're God, there is no other. And, and, and you behold the glory of God. And I think anytime we hear a sermon, you should always point back to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, where he becomes the focus of, and sometimes that's not what it is. Modern church day, that's not what it is. Modern church day, the focus is you. What are you going to get out of this? How can you be blessed? How can you be, you know, make more money? How can you, whatever it might be? Well, always the main thing is God himself. Where is he in my life? Who is he in my life? But that gets down to the second point when you've got to keep it second. It's not first. And that's just who am I in relationship to God? Not what can I get from God? Not how God can benefit me. Who is God and who am I in relationship to that? Isaiah in chapter six went on to say, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. But in his confession, if you read the passage, it says that the angels took the tongue from off the altar and touched it, it cleansed him. Basically, when he confessed his sin before this righteous holy God, God forgave him of his sin and changed his heart and gave him a ministry. He said, I have a purpose for your life. I have direction for your life. I have meaning for your life. Let's take it up and let's get after it. So after we hear the word of God, I think then we can really be more accurate about ourselves because most of us don't have a proper opinion of ourselves anyway. 
I mean, that's even our Christian selves. Most people suffer in their spiritual walk in life because they really don't know who they are in relationship to God now. I mean, the idea of who they used to be, what they were before Christ. But James put it this way. He said, you know, it's like a man who looks in a mirror and walks away and doesn't do anything about what he saw. And that's exactly when we hear sermons, it's like someone holding up a mirror to us and if a mirror comes up, there's this reflection. We ought to be able to see the glory of God in it, but also we get a little glimpse of ourselves. And James said, you have wasted your time. You are forgetful here. If you don't take to heart what you've heard, you're not really listening at that point. So we ask, you know, who is God? In the context of that, how is it between us? This ought to be on our heart. It has between me and my father. It has between me and the, and the Lord. And after I've heard the message, it certainly ought to, ought to be that. How is it between me and the Lord? Well, I'll tell you, if we can hone our hearing, it'll be a lot better between us and the Lord. If we can learn how to listen carefully and correctly, it'll prepare us to hear from the Lord. I remember Cherish used to try to get my attention. She's probably five or six. And uh, I'd be doing something around the house, working on something or reading the paper, even watching the news or something. She'd come and say, Dad, Dad. I'm sure Joseph did this as well. Dad. <laughs> I finally turned around on Joe. What are you calling me Joe for? Because you're not listening. <laughs> How many times do we do that with, with the Lord? How many times do we do that with the Lord? God's speaking, I believe, more than most of us realize. People say, well, God's not talking to me. I think he's talking. You're just not wanting to hear what he's saying. Or there's things in the way, such as Isaiah, who said, I had a sinful heart. So that when the Lord spoke to me, I wasn't hearing but when this revelation came with the glory of God, the word of God, the power of God, he said, I saw myself and I got right with God. You know what he says after that? After he confessed his sin? Catch this. Then I heard. Maybe there's something that's keeping you from hearing. Not that God's not speaking. Is that we're just not listening. Let me close this last verse here. In Proverbs Listen, for I shall speak noble things and the opening of my lips will produce right things. There's another translation of that that puts that first part like this. Listen, for I have worthy things to say. Well, there's nothing more worthy to listen to than the word of God. There's nothing more powerful to listen to the word of God. The Apostle Paul said the word of God, the gospel itself is, is a power that has the, a, a unique through, through the use of the, the words that I preach to, to people, it has the power to save them. I mean, literally, the Word of God has the power to deliver me. I'm on my way to hell. I'm bound to hell. I'm under condemnation. I'm under judgment. And if I hear the gospel and respond to it, I'm not going to hell. What can change that spiritual law that's in operation from time and eternity to, that says the wages of sin is death? It comes from the mouth of God, but also it comes from the mouth of God is the living word, Jesus. And that's the good news. And the good news says that your life can be changed by giving your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. And when you do that, God does a supernatural work. But it's the same thing. The Bible says, Paul writes this. He says, he says as we behold his face, as we look unto Jesus, he says, we are changed by the Holy Spirit from glory to glory. What does that mean? I'm not what I used to be. And next week, I shouldn't be what I was last week. <laughs> there ought to be some changes. There ought to be growth. There ought to be maturing. But so much of that is right here. Now, it's not just hearing the sermon. You've got to get in this book on your own as well. Amen. Right. You need to be studying, reading, preparing. But when you come to church, the art of listening has to do with preparation of your own heart, prayer, compliance, keeping everything in focus that God's got a word for you and he's doing something in your life which will eventually not only transform you, but will make a difference in the world around you. Now, I'm not going to give an invitation today. I'm just going to ask you to come back next Sunday with prepared heart. Come ready to hear the word of God. And I'm going to do something I know is difficult for some. I'm going to ask you to be on time. Amen. You know? I'll make sure we get one of those little gluey paper stars for you. Put it by your name in the office. If that's what it takes. Lady asked me at the other campus this morning, well, it's raining out there. It's raining out there. Do I, 
Do I get another star in my crown? I'm thinking, I hope you got a crown. <laughs> Not really. I didn't. I'll, if I think about it now, that was probably a good thought, but I said, no, but we're not going to take any away. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, there are rewards that can be received or lost. Don't lose what God has for you because you won't hear what God's saying to you. Let's stand with our heads bowed, and after that, Brother Tim's going to come and give us some closing announcements.